Hello everyone, welcome back to Earth Materials. Today I'd like to talk about the interior of the Earth, and of course there's lots of stories about what there might be in the underworld. This particular uh, painting shows Orpheus and Eurydice in front of Hades, and Persephone is his wife, right? Charon is ferrying souls across, and this is maybe what people thought the interior of the Earth looked like a thousand years ago or, or so. Uh, but today we want to talk about how we as scientists know about the, what the Earth's interior looks like. And so I'm going to be talking about three different techniques that we use, and I'm going to spend a little bit of time at the end on seismic wave propagation. Nothing major, just some, some basic principles. And so at the end of this, I hope that students will have a better understanding of the different methods that we use for investigating the interior of the Earth, and then also have some concept of how seismic waves propagate. Okay, so how do we actually know about the interior of the Earth? Well, of course, Hollywood, of course, has its own ideas about what might be in the interior of the Earth. Here's this vast cave with giant mushrooms. But in fact, one of the principal ways that we know what is inside the Earth is from xenoliths and xenocrysts. So these are foreign rocks. Xeno is foreign, lith is rock, and foreign crystals, xenocrysts, that come up in volcanic eruptions. Most of the deep xenoliths come up in intraplate volcanic rocks, so hot spots and rifts. They are usually in basalts, but can also come up in kimberlites, which are much deeper derived melts. So here's an example of a peridotite xenolith upper mantle, xenolith from Kilburn Hole. This is Kilburn, an, an air photo of Kilburn Hole. Here is a kimberlite locality in South Africa, and here's, a, here's an image of a kimberlite with these big xenocrysts in it. And here's, here's what the structure of a, of a typical kimberlite looks like. This gets us down mm, 100 kilometers to about 300 kilometers depth, which is about 10% of the way down into the mantle. Kimberlites do contain diamonds. The diamonds contain inclusions, and some of these inclusions contain minerals that are stable below 660 kilometers. So even though the kimberlite might be derived from 300 kilometers depth, the crystals that it carries are coming from much deeper. So here's a picture of a diamond in, in a rock, but some of these crystals that we're seeing are perovskite structured, and some of them also contain these interesting iron nickel alloys. So these are x-ray maps. The brighter the color on these, the greater the concentration of these elements. And you can see that there is, are regions of high nickel and low nickel and high iron and low iron. These are interpreted to be an original iron nickel alloy that separated into two different minerals, a nickel-rich mineral and an iron-rich mineral, metals. We will come back to these iron-nickel alloys in a later lecture. But this is one of the pieces of information that tells us what might be in the deep earth. Meteorites are thought to be analogous to the earth in their chemistry. So we see the materials that show up in meteorites and we extrapolate to Earth's interior. In fact, this kind of meteorite right here, carbonaceous chondrite, is thought to be representative of one of the principal components of Earth's silicate interior. We can also use experimental petrology to see whether we can produce materials that have the right properties in terms of density, seismic velocity, and so on. With the right equipment, we can get pressures as deep as the lower mantle. Here is an example of a piston cylinder apparatus. So this is a certain kind of press. There's a piston that inserts into this hole. Answer is, it turns out to be approximately the annual income of a pediatrician. So these are not cheap instruments, but they are not out of reach of research institutions. 
If you want to look at pressures that are even deeper, we can employ a device that's called a diamond anvil. And when I say diamond anvil, I do not mean the Minecraft diamond anvil. I mean this kind of apparatus here. So what this is, is it's two opposing crystals of diamond. Here's some diamonds that give you an idea of the, the sizes that we're talking about. They have their points shaved off and on those opposing points, there is a tiny region where the sample is placed and it's held in place with a gasket that, that goes around. So the two diamonds are forced together and the pressure on the tiny faces of these diamonds increases the pressure in the sample and allows us to investigate the mineralogy of what forms at high pressure. Interesting, what's interesting about diamonds is that they are transparent to x-rays and also to other sorts of lasers that we can shine through there. So we can use x-ray diffraction, for example, or Raman spectra or, or another way of identifying the mineralogy of these materials at ultra high pressure. Then last, there is a multi-anvil device. Here's an example of one from the Bayerische Geo Institute in southern Germany. These are presses that all oppose each other and raise the pressure in these interior cells to ultra high pressures. These allow larger samples to be investigated for their mineralogy. The last way that we know about the interior of the Earth primarily is through geophysical observations. So you're probably aware that we have two kinds of seismic waves. There are P waves and S waves, primary and secondary waves. And so earthquakes, nuclear explosions, for example, send shock waves that propagate through the Earth. And we can use the arrival of the P waves, the compressional waves, and the S waves, the shear waves, to figure out what the in interior of the Earth must look like. And one of the ways that, in fact, that we know that the outer core exists in a liquid state is because of these shadows that occur in S waves and P waves. So as a, just a quick review, which of the following would not be an effective approach to determine the composition of the interior of the Earth? And the answer is analyzing Hadean aged rocks. All of these other techniques, in principle, tell us something about Earth's interior. Okay, so at this point, I hope you can identify different methods that we use to study the Earth and have some sense for its appropriateness for studying the different layers within the Earth. Some of these techniques are good for the lower mantle, others for the upper mantle and crust. So now let's move on to seismic wave propagation. As I mentioned, there are P waves and S waves, compressional waves and shear waves. P waves travel through anything and their particle motion is parallel to wave propagation. So they're like sound waves that compress and expand air. The propagation direction is the same as the particle motion. Shear waves travel only through solids and the particle motion is perpendicular to wave propagation. So here is a little video that explains the difference between P waves and S waves using this slinky. Okay, so those are S waves. The motion is up and down. And this is gonna be a P wave. So the motion is in and out in the direction of the propagation. There's a little bit of S wave activity there too. The velocities of a P wave and an S wave depend somewhat differently on the physical properties of a rock. So the velocity of a P wave is the square root of the bulk modulus. The bulk modulus is the degree to which the volume changes in a rock if you compress it. So it's a change in volume with respect to pressure. Mu is the shear modulus, so this is the degree to which a rock resists shear stresses, and rho is the density of the material. And here you can see that the shear wave velocity depends only on the shear modulus. It does not depend on the bulk modulus. And of course, it's the bulk modulus which allows P waves to pass through liquids where mu is equal to zero. 
Now, ordinarily, mu increases faster than rho, so commonly, seismic velocities increase with increasing pressure for a particular mineral. It's also true that higher pressure mineral assemblages have higher velocities. So again, increasing pressure will increase velocity. And it's also true that the different types of silicates tend to have systematically different velocities. So island silicates, ortho silicates, tend to have a higher velocity than single chain silicates, pyroxenes, double chain silicates, amphiboles, sheet silicates, micas, and so on. Typical velocities for the crust are about six kilometers per second, and for the upper mantle are about eight kilometers per second. There's a discontinuity between the crust and the mantle, and this, in fact, is how many people infer the thickness of the crust is this shift from crustal velocities to upper mantle velocities. And then the velocities increase with some steps up to about 13 kilometers per second at the core mantle boundary. So now here's a question for you. What would happen to seismic waves if they passed from the wall rock into a liquid magma chamber? And the answer is only the P wave transmits. So liquids cannot sustain shear stresses. So if there's a liquid magma chamber, the S wave cannot transmit through it. Because the P wave depends also on the bulk modulus, a P wave will transmit. It will not have the same velocity, but it will transmit. Now, the way that we interpret the seismic structure of the Earth recognizes the fact that sometimes the quickest way to get somewhere isn't in a straight line. Okay, so here I am at home. If I need to go to the grocery store, I'm probably gonna take surface streets, okay? There is a fast pathway on the freeway, but it would actually take longer for me to go down to the freeway, go along the freeway, and then come back to my grocery store than it would be for me to drive directly from my house to the grocery store. As distances become farther, it becomes a little less clear which is going to be faster. Maybe I could take the surface roads, or maybe I could go to the freeway, go along the freeway quickly for a while, and then cut across to get to the same time in maybe about the same time. Now, if I want to go to the next state, I'm not going to take these, these small roads, the more direct route. I'm going to go to the freeway, take the freeway down for a while, and then take the slow road to my destination, because this is the quickest way to get there. Now, what's important is that for short distances, what I'm sampling are the speed of the surface roads. For larger distances, I'm going to be sampling the local velocity as well, but I'm also going to see this high speed along the freeway. So we see that with respect to the arrival of seismic waves. Every time there is a seismic event, there, if these are different stations or detectors on the surface of the Earth, there is a direct ray. That's like taking the surface roads. And there's a refracted ray. So a refracted ray comes down here to a high velocity layer, similar to our freeway. It goes rapidly along the high velocity layer and then comes back up to the surface. So for stations that are very close to a seismic event, the direct ray will arrive first. So here is our time sequence. Here is the direct arrival. And then here is a refracted arrival. So it may come down here, go for a short amount of time, and come back. As we get farther and farther, the timing of the direct arrival versus the refracted arrival gets closer and closer. The refracted arrival is making more use of this fast pathway. And eventually, for distant detectors, the refracted ray will arrive before the direct ray. Now we can plot this in terms of the time since the seismic event. So this is how long does it take to see this ray versus distance. And what we find is that there are two different linear arrays that form. There's the direct ray. So this is the ray that's going right along the surface of the Earth. And then there's the refracted ray. There's a point where these two cross over. So eventually, the refracted ray arrives earlier in time than the direct ray. One thing you will see is that these slopes are different. Now, what, what do these slopes correspond to? 
the y-axis is time and the x-axis is distance. So this slope is equal to delta t over delta x. Well, delta t over delta x is the reciprocal of delta x over delta t, and delta x over delta t is the velocity. So the slope on these lines tells you the, the velocity of the different layers, and a shallower line on one of these slopes indicates a faster horizon. The person who first made use of this, as far as I know, was a fellow named Andre Mohorovicic. And here is an example of some of the data that he published. These show the direct ray arrival and the refracted ray arri arrival. This is a little bit hard to make out. So this has been replotted. So here's our refracted array. Here's our direct ray for this particular event. Here's a different event, the direct ray and the refracted array. You can see these don't have quite the same slopes. It's particularly evident for these, the red lines here. And the intersection point of that red line is down here. That's where the direct ray and refracted rays arrive at the same time. And this is the intersection point, the projected intersection point, where the direct ray and the refracted ray arrive at the same times. Why do we care about this? This particular intersection point can be inverted knowing the velocity structures to figure out the thickness of the different horizons. So that's what allows us then to start investigating how thick is the crust, how thick is the upper mantle, how thick is the asthenosphere, these different layers within the Earth and so on. This shows a contour map of crustal thickness across the Earth. Antarctica is not nearly this large, that's just the projection. But you can see here that it ranges from about 30 kilometers in many of these lighter colored regions to about 40 kilometers through much of the cratons, the stable cratons of continents in here and reaches maximal thicknesses of about 70 to about 80 kilometers in the edge of the Tibetan Plateau and on the Puna Altiplano Plateau. The seismic velocities show various discontinuities. We were just talking about the MOHO, which is this increase in velocity here. But there are some other important ones. In the upper 1,000 kilometers of Earth, there is a discontinuity at about 400 kilometers depth, and a second one at about 670 kilometers depth. We'll discuss the origin of those discontinuities later. If we look into the next several thousand kilometers, then we see there's a big seismic velocity discontinuity at about 3,000 kilometers depth, and then there's a second one at a little over 5,000 kilometers depth. And these correspond to changes in the chemistry, whether this is the lower mantle, which is silicates and oxides, and the, versus the outer core and inner core, which are metallic. Now, as I mentioned before, the Earth has these shadow zones. There's a big one for S waves, and there's also a smaller one for P waves. This is consistent with an a liquid outer core. The sizes of the shadow zones allow us to define the radius of the liquid. So that's how far out this boundary between the liquid outer core and the solid lower mantle exists. There's an interesting layer at that boundary. It's called D double prime. It corresponds to an interesting chemical and mineralogical variability right at this boundary. It's thought that many of the plumes that we observe on Earth actually originate at the core mantle boundary. So which of the following might characterize a seismic discontinuity? And the answer is all of the above. Of, of course, seismic wave velocity can't increase and decrease at a seismic discontinuity. But a discontinuity can correspond to an increase or a decrease. And usually, it's where there's a characteristic change in the rock. So which of the following is not the depth of a discontinuity?
And the answer is at 840 kilometers. There's nothing particular going on there. So at this point, I would hope that you'd be able to give some examples of how seismic waves might interact with different materials, especially focusing on the difference between their interaction with solids versus liquids. Okay, thanks very much.